Thank you. I can't believe those guys talk like that. It's a put on is what it is. It's, listen to me, I've got 5,000 people in my congregation. Adrian. <laughs> I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I always read to you emails before we start. Uh, I believe things, it, we are going out over the internet, and people are watching us all over the world, uh, watching us in Africa and, and uh, Australia and all over Europe and South America and, and Africa and some all, a little bit everywhere and all over the United States. And these people write to us and they ask me questions and they make comments. And uh, Angel in Colorado writes to us, Dear Jim, Mary, and family, Agape and Flail to all, just wanted to thank you for helping me get my car fixed. We gave her some money and several people from... The ministry gave her some money to get, it was about $2,400, but we got it fixed. It was a blessing. She is great, running great. I have a whole new appreciation for her. I am so grateful for your gracious and timely gift. I love you all at Grace and Truth Ministries, and I pray for your strength to continue. Jim Brown, I'm glad she put that on the end, Jim Brown. I've got my bankers calling him, hey, Jim Brown. And instead of calling me Mr. Brown, I keep telling him Mr. Brown was my father. Just call me Jim Brown. We used to have a bunch of little kids coming here and walk up to me and say, hey, Jim Brown. And <laughs> say both names. <laughs> Angel in Colorado. We love you, Angel. Keep writing. Then Michael from Las Vegas writes, Michael, you got to stop telling me what to preach and who to call down. If you like what I'm teaching, say it. But I'm not going to read your emails that tell me what to do. I'm just, you just, you're getting on Tom's nerves and you're begin, about to get on mine. you always telling me what to do. I don't mind you doing that, but I'm not going to read them. Then Alexis Hernandez in California. Brother Brown, Grace and Truth family, blessings to you all. I want to ask you to please add an address to your mailing list to receive DVDs for you. I run a prison ministry here in California. I was previously incarcerated for five and a half years. I felt led to share the word to those incarcerated, which also showing mercy and compassion to them. One of my brothers in the Lord, who was in prison with me, teaches a Bible study there in prison and to other inmates and has now been granted the opportunity to receive DVDs through the prison chaplain. will give us that address and we'll start sending to them. I see this as an opportunity to get the truth in here to them and to strengthen the elect. Please add the following address to the mailing list and he gives that. This is Brother Jeremiah, whom I have mentioned in the past email when I went to go visit him in prison last month. He was interested in the ministry and the truths that you teach. Please notify me with your answer. I greatly appreciate it. Love you and the truth. Alexis Hernandez in California. We love you, Alexis. You keep on writing. Then I got an uh, email from Robert Goff, G-O-F-F, -F, in Illinois. Hello, thank, I thank God for your teaching. I would greatly appreciate if you could help me understand how we as believers can listen to how God talks to us through the Word. That's it. Read your Bible. 
Get a Strong's Concordance and define the words. The Holy Spirit is in us. That's the kingdom of God. That helps us to understand all things. According to John uh, 15, uh, 32 and 33, I understand that obeying God is perceived by how we walk as believers. Well, how we walk is what we believe. And that shows the fruit of the Spirit. That's true. If I petition Christ in prayer, you bow to His will. Regarding something like, Father, how would you have me respond to a situation? You'll find the answer in the Bible. Or person. Obviously, if they will hear the truth, keep talking to them. If they reject it after the second admonition, leave them alone. Titus 3.10. I'm not expecting a, a physical voice to answer. It won't. The reason for this question is very serious. I sometimes feel like maybe the answer comes to me in my mind, not without application to the Word of God. But can I be certain that it's not me psychologically answering myself? You're not going to answer yourself. You've got to go with the Word of God. You're not reading enough of the Word if you don't know answers. Nothing wrong with that if you're a baby believer. It takes a long time to grow, years. I know when I hear you teach, I agree with everything you're teaching on, and I know that the Spirit inside of me doing the agreeing with the truth. Please tell me how I can be sure Christ is instructing me. I only ask because, like I said, this is very serious to me. It was serious to all of us. I want to be obedient and please God, but sometimes when I ask Him to tell me what and how to proceed in something, you got to remember, ask is a conditional word. We receive the things that we ask if we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Keep to reo. Pleasing you, A R E S K O. To reo means to guard against loss. They're in our heart. And you're supposed to. It's like you're standing in front of a big uh, safe. And <coughs> within that safe, which is your heart, the, Bible, the words are written in fleshy tags of our heart. That's like the big, the big area of fenced-in area. And you're like a guard on the front of it. And regardless of how you're living, you know that that's true. And you say, I will fight to preserve these laws. That's Toreo. Even when I was out in the music world, I did not forget the Bible. I constantly talked to people about it. I came off the stage one time and some person asked, said, you sound like a preacher. I said, I am one. <laughs> After I did one set, you know on the stage. And then pleasing you arresco comes from E U A R E S T E O. That's the same word in Romans twelve and one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable Arresto. It's a form of you arresco. It means well pleasing. So what's pleasing to God is death to self. You expect to get what you ask. There has to be death to self involved, and you have to be retaining the word of God. But don't always think that God's going to come and talk to you. That's not what he does. He speaks to us through the word. All right. Let me get back to where I was. I want to be obedient and please God, but sometimes when I ask him to tell me what and how to proceed in something, 
I don't feel like I hear. Remember, hear and obey are the basic same word. you got to be obeying God. Don't look for some miracle answers. God's not going to stick his head out of the sky and say, here's what I want you to do. It doesn't work that way. He's given his word through the book, the Bible. I hear, I don't think I hear a definitive answer. Just keep going forward. Sometimes the answer is you're asking the wrong question. That's the answer according to your lifestyle. It terrifies me that I might not belong to him. And that's a good statement. The only people that are terrified that they might not belong to God are believers. Because <laughs> that's your outer man feeling. If you don't think you belong to God, you, you nearly always do. Because you have an inner man and an outer man. The only man that will question whether you belong to God is the inner man. That's the new birth. Because you keep looking at your outer man, you say, he's not living right. <laughs> In time, you will live right. We love you, Robert. Keep writing. Anthony Vega in New York. Hey, big brother Jim. Hey, Anthony. It's Anthony again. God bless you. The Bible says in Romans ten seventeen. so faith cometh by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But so I'm going to continue to listen and obey and listen to you define words. Thank you again. Because you actually are doing all the work for anyone who's interested in getting a good biblical sound interpretation of what God's Word says. Thanks again, Jim. Anthony Vega in New York. We love you, Anthony. Keep writing. And then James Hassler, been with us 20 years, I guess, writing from East China, Michigan. Jim, I know you talk about this before, and I apologize for not remembering the word called in Romans 8 and 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. To them who are the called. Called is the word kaleo. Called that the called of God is the church. Ek. K L E S I A comes from Ek. And kaleo, meaning you called out of this world. That ought to help you some. Uh, is the word called in Romans 8.30 an imperative command? No, it's not there. But in order to have an imperative command, you've got to have a verb commanding you. Repent. Preach the word. Strive, agonism, I agonize entering in. You can't just take any word and make it imperative. You got to look up a word in a analytical lexicon. Get an analytical lexicon, learn the alphabet, look it up exactly, and it'll say I M P if it's imperative. But it's got to be the call. Call there is a noun. It's not a verb. So it has to be a verb to be an imperative mood. A verb shows action, jump, run, throw. That's an action verb. If God says, if he says, preach the word, be instant, in season, preach caruso, means herald Christ, that's an imperative command. Thank you again because you actually are doing all the work for anyone who's interested in getting a good biblical sign interpretation of what God's Word says. Thanks again, Jim. Anthony, wait a minute, That's I got back on another one. Has Jim researched Romans 10, 9, and 10? <laughs> so many times I can't count. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess. Homo, L-O-G-E-O, -E of the same, looks like homosexual. It is, homosexual is a Greek word, of the same sex. This means of the same logos, word. It means to agree with. 
agree with if thou shalt confess. But here's the amazing thing. I don't know why these translators did what they did. Titus 1.16 says, Some men profess that they know God. Profess is the same word, homologeo. But in works, what they do, they deny him. So you have to have works worthy to be called works of repentance. Faith without works is dead. He's created us in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in the good works. You cannot have faith without works. Righteous works are a result of faith. They're not, they don't cause faith. They're the results. If you believe the above verse, you could, you could be one of the few. Well, but you have to be doing to be confessing. You cannot, if you, some men profess that they know God, Jesus said, this people Israel honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Lip service don't mean nothing. Zero. It's what you do. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Don't think you can get by just saying, I believe the Bible and I believe predestination. But I don't want to talk to anybody about it. If it's in your heart, it wants to come out of your mouth. Of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I can't keep from talking about the truth to everybody I can. I just can't stop myself. I don't even want to stop myself. I want people to know. I don't talk about the truth to get attention. I talk about because I love God's Word. I can't stop from doing this stuff up here. What is few? What is few? What is few of many? Well, few is few, holy gods, and many is many, holy gods. The many is most of the people in the world, they're going to hell. Few is less than many. <laughs> Thank you for that obvious uh, observation. We can't know how many are how few. I never figure, try to figure out who a believer is. I just talk to everybody. Every once in a while I run across somebody that says, boy, that's really good. I'd like to know more about that. Very seldom that happens. I carry DVDs in my pocket that I can give to people. And I give them away just dozens of them every week maybe four or five a day. And you know how many calls I've got from these people? Zero. None. But that's my, not my job. I even try to sell them on watching them. I've been thinking about telling them, if you watch this number one DVD here, if you watch this first message, if you will watch it and when I see you again, I'll give you $10. That's an easy way to learn to earn $10. I might give them $20. I imagine I can't get many people to watch. And I'll tell them, now I'm going to ask you questions about it. And I'll, I'll know by your answers. If I say, what would you think about that? And you say, oh, it was okay. I say, you didn't watch it, did you? Why are you trying to tell me you did when you didn't? Because you're not going to say it was okay. Nope. Because it's going to hurt you. All right. That's enough from James. James, we love you. Keep writing to us. And then Lisa in Florida, I talked to her uh, about this very thing. Hello, hey, Lisa. Thank you for your messages and teachings. The word is out that an outpouring of the Holy Spirit has commenced on a well-known seminary. Oh, good grief. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit is Pentecostal terminology. Did you know that? And she said, should I go to one of these meetings? I said, no. It's charismatic. I told her, I said, I don't agree with most things that all the preachers say. I don't even agree with most of the Greek teachers. 
Greek teachers don't know everything. The news is being published on YouTube. People are flocking there in droves. They wouldn't be flocking in droves if they were preaching predestination is true and Christmas is pavement. They, they wouldn't be getting hardly any people there. They're speaking in tongues and healing people. The term revival is being associated with this, and it is appearing to many. I'm in a search of biblical scriptural answers regarding this. They don't have any. There's very few churches out here believe predestination is true. God does not love everybody. Stay away from them. I told her that on the phone. We love you, Lisa. Just I know you kind of knew at this and you don't know exactly what's true and it's easy to be led away. Call me and I'll advise you. We love you. And then Johnny and Yvette Dillon in Florida. Hello, Mary. Thank you for your response. Being that Yvette and I live in Miami area, we have consistent access to the Internet and the ministry with great appreciation. I'll pass on the DVD offer and hope their resources can be used by others in need. We do hope to visit in person one day and enjoy a session of Bible teaching in person as well as meet some of the team. Again, thanks for all you do. To God be the glory, Johnny and Yvette Dillon in Florida. We love you guys. Keep writing. Then we got an email from Rebecca Rogers. She's out in Luke, Texas. We've kind of reached out to help her get... Uh, get her water heater fixed and uh, we send her a little money each month because she needs it. She's really in a struggle. She's in a wheelchair. She's got a brother that's got cancer and she's just having a hard time. So we try to help her all that we can. Dear Brother Jim and Sister Mary, Here's what I'm dealing with. My brother, caregiver, saw my doctor and saw his MRI. His lung cancer has spread into his voice and spine, and there's nothing else to do. The doctor said he could do treatment, but he is very weak and wouldn't give him any more time. I'm trying to take care of him. She's in a wheelchair. There's too many things I can't do. He can't drive anymore, and our truck is not legal, so we are giving our truck to Brother Paul. I believe that's their neighbor next door. He didn't have any transportation, and he takes us to the doctor and grocery store in our truck. I used your money, the money we send her each month, to get David to see a doctor. Yes, we are struggling in so many ways. There's a lot of people like that out there. My heart really goes out to them. I pray God gives me strength I need. David can't work anymore. We're losing 600 a month. I don't know what that means. I don't know how we are going to make it. There's a lot of people out there. I'll tell you what we'll do, Rebecca. We'll raise you $100 a month, okay? That'll probably help a little bit with all the problems you've got. We can't take people to raise. I was at the grocery store yesterday. A little Spanish-Mexican lady come up to me, and she just looked pitiful, spoke in broken English. She said, I need some help. I, help. I, got, I got a bunch of kids over here in my van, and they are hungry, and I haven't fed them. She said, would you come over here? And she showed me the van with the kids in it. I took $20 out and gave it to her, and I gave her a DVD. I said, my phone is on the bottom of that. You call me, and I'll probably give you some more money. But you've got to do that. Watch this DVD and call that number. And I hadn't heard from her yet. I don't know where her husband was. She was very pitiful. I could see that. She had a a van, an old van full of kids, and one of them didn't have any shoes on. His It was cold yesterday, and he had barefooted. 
I just feel so bad for people like that. But I wanted to kind of tell her, if you call me, I'll get you some more money. I'm not saying that to boast. I don't know how anybody else could be touched by that. I know that I can't live by myself because I'm a fall risk. I don't want to go to senior prison. Old folks home. <laughs> That's what she calls senior prison. Can't live with family because they're goats. My brother David is a believer in Alethea, and that means that she's listening. Truth. Thank you for teaching Alethea truth, and it really helps to know that God is in control of everything. Agape, Rebecca Rogers, and Luke, Texas. We'll start sending you a little more money. Okay, Rebecca? Now i got some YouTube comments. Most of these people hate me for some reason. I don't know why. I'm just trying to define truth. Frank Fudd, maybe he's Ken Delmer, commented on the name and mark of the beast. Okay, so don't disobey God's law. But how does that relate to the physical world, branding people like cattle and telling them if they don't have a certain mark, stamp, code, chip, tattoo, they can't buy or sell? You haven't listened hardly any of my, my DVDs, have you? The word mark is the word karagman revelation. Karagma is the word mark. It means character or personality. And the character, I've said this, the character of the beast started in the Garden of Eden. It's just amazing. I have people write to me and don't understand that concepts of truth. This is mathematical. Concepts of truth remain the same from Genesis all the way through Revelation. They remain the same. If you can find out, let me show you what I'm talking about. The word transgression in 1 John 3 and, and uh, 5 or 3 and 6. The word transgression transgression that that iniquity is the transgression of the law. Iniquity is the word A-N-O-M-I-A. Anomia. Anomia comes from the Greek word nomos. That is the Greek word for law and it means legal Prescribe, food for animals. And we are sheep. Where did that start? It didn't start in First John. It started in the garden. Back here. Legally prescribed food for animals. There was a tree in the midst of the garden. Anomia means unlawful food. That started in the garden. There was a tree in the middle of the garden. Looked like a Christmas tree. And there was all these trees outside of the garden, inside the garden, in the boundary line. That word karagma comes from the word karax, which means a stake. On a boundary line. Well, there was a stake here. You can't go inside and eat of that tree. It's unlawful. That's where iniquity started. That's where sin started too. <laughs> sin is the word hamartia. H, sin. H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. -A -A. Hamartia. There are no H's in the Greek. It's just ah, meros. Meros means a portion to eat of. 
When the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, we are members in particular, the word particular is meros. Ameros, the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet as a negative particle negates the word, means unlawful portion to eat of. So it has the basic same meaning as iniquity. Where did that start? In the garden. God says, thou shalt not eat of that tree in the midst of the garden. That's iniquity. That's hamartia. It's unlawful food. That's where it started. That's going to hold true all the way through the Bible. That makes the Bible easier to understand when you believe when something's mentioned the first time. It's called the law of first mentioned. It never changes. God doesn't change. So therefore, when you get over here in the New Testament, get into the word iniquity, and you get into the word hamartia, and it, it said that sin is feminine in gender. Now, I've got a right guy writing to me. He says, it don't matter about feminine, and masculine, and neuter gender. Yes, it does. You don't believe that God has ordained the gender. I believe he's ordained everything to the finest point. Feminine gender, does that mean only females can sin? That's right. Only females can sin. There's two people in the world. There's Babylonians. That holds true from Genesis 11 and 4 all the way to the end of the Bible. Revelation 17 and 5 said Babylon is the mother. That's feminine. Of harlots. That word harlot, porne, means idolatry. So everywhere you find people fighting God, that's feminine gender. What are the two females? Babylonians. And it's amazing. It was, it was a female that first sinned Eve. Adam wasn't deceived. The Bible says that. Only Eve was deceived. Babylonians and Christians. They're the only two. What are Christians feminine? They are the wife, the bride of Christ. Christians can sin. They got an inner man and an outer man. The outer man can't quit sinning. So there's only two that can sin in the world, and they're female. Now, if you remember the church, you're female. You're the wife, the bride of Christ. And I don't know why people don't believe God. God ordains genders. I believe he ordains every fine point of the Bible. Let me finish reading these things here. And this guy, Frank Fudd, says, but how does they relate to the physical world? And he goes through all this. If the mark is only spiritual, the mark was in the garden. What was in the tree? That's what's forbidden. Now, the Bible says in 1 John, Two sixteen. All that's in the world. Here's everything to go after in the world. All in the world. Should I say, this is everything that demons distribute. Demon, daemonion means to distribute fortunes. Distribute fortunes. Well, this is everything they distribute. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. And the pride of life. Those are the same three things that Eve saw in that tree in the garden. She tr saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. And it make her wise. That's the th What's amazing, a demon was the same thing as a genie. And how many gifts you get from a genie? You get three wishes. And this will include everything, women and men and money and houses and things and stuff. 
It holds true from one end of the Bible to the other. If you learn one end of the Bible, you'll know what's going on at the other end. It doesn't change. I've got a guy writing to me saying God don't matter. Genders don't matter. Genders are everything. You've got to separate the church from the world. And then, uh, then he says, uh, why is a physical mark? <laughs> it's not a physical mark. It's a mark in the forehead and upon the hand. But that started with Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, where the Bible, where the Lord tells Israel, put my law on your hand or put it between your eyes. So they came up with these phylacteries, little black boxes, and stuck them between their eyes. It's talking about in the mind. And put it where your hand, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with to the glory of God and do it with all your might. That's what it's talking about. It comes from the mind. That's the mark of the beast. Has nothing to do with computer chips. That's so stupid. I mean, computer chips are really way outdated. We got DNA now. A computer chip is dumb. I heard preachers saying that when I was a kid. I thought, what are they talking about? Anyway, that's enough of this fella. Randy Allen. Why will you believe, do not believe in demons? He says, this man is a false prophet. <laughs> I thought I'd say it the way he says it. <laughs> Randy, if you want any more DVDs, just give us a call. And we'll mail them to you free of charge, okay? Then M.H. commented on Moses comes to Mount of God, a particular people, God's jewels. I went to a prophecy conference at a friend's Calvary Chapel. That's the wrong place to go. Calvary Chapel Church a year ago, I couldn't believe how much the speakers pushed the pre-trib rapture. All the Baptists believe that. Just because some Baptist teaches it, just because some so-called conservative Bible teacher or Greek teacher preaches it, you can't necessarily believe it. Have you learned that yet? Don't believe somebody because they're authorities. Check it out. The Bereans checked out what Paul was saying. And Paul said they're more honorable than the rest of the churches because they checked to see if what I was saying was true. Check me out. I've had people say, I'm going to check you out. I say, you promise. <laughs> I was, it was like being a high priest. <laughs> it was like being in a high pressure sales meeting. These Baptists teaching the preacher of rapture. <laughs> David Davenport commented on Christmas is pagan. Constantine brought it into the church. The early Christian fathers were anti-pagan. Well, you're right. They often gave their lives to a, to a set their humility before Christ. They would not pattern a Christian feast day or holy day after the pagans. You should know that. Well, I preached on that about 500 times. What do you mean? Like I didn't know it. You're not watching enough of my DVDs. Jeffrey Lewis commented on Revelation and Daniel, 70 weeks, begins with the fourth degree. In the MI2, does self-existing mean that God created himself? <laughs> Jehovah means self-existent. And God says, I exist. I'm just, ex I'm the existing God. I always have existed, I always will. You can't explain the self-existing God, can you? I can't. It is so, that is beyond mind-blowing. You're exactly right. It's mind-blowing. I got a letter from a guy. I don't agree with him at all. He sounds like an intelligent guy, but he's trying to instruct me on some Greek. I don't believe he knows what he's talking about. Dear Jim, this is from Marshall Shetler. I don't agree with you, Marshall. Dear Jim, thank you so much for your last response to my questions on Hebrews 3.11. I apologize in advance for the length of this message. The reason I asked you that question was to see if you still have the same view 
of, that I have heard said in other messages in the past? Yes, I absolutely do. There is no easy way to say that you are in error. I believe you're in error, Marshall. Because you're believing professors and Greek teachers, and I, always, I don't always agree with them. That you use the Koine Greek for that verse and other verses. What else can I use that was in Koine? There are a lot of ways you use Greek well, which is great. You know all the declensions and have some categories in the back of Wallace Greek grammar beyond basics. The mistake that you make repeatedly is thinking that the gender of a noun affects the meaning and translation of it. That is crazy when you say that. You mean it does? the gender doesn't have anything to do with the noun? Let me read to you. Mr. Mr. Uh, William Mouse's concept. He says, all the modifiers of the nouns, a modifier is like an adjective, blue bird. Adjectives tell which, what kind of, how many. And they modify nouns and the pronouns. Modify means to alter. And Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Wallace says the same when you have a modifier of a noun. It, the noun and the modifier must have the same case, the same number, and the same gender. Why? Because the gender doesn't matter? He says some crazy things here. You don't give me any information on this. There's a whole lot of things that Greek scholars say that I don't agree with. Do I believe they knew anything about numbers? No. I believe they just accept it. When you get into thousand years, and we write it this way, 1,000. I got a book written by a mathematician. He says they had no zeros in the first century None. Even Mr. Bullinger will tell you any multiple of 10 or 100,000 is a form of the original number. Now, I haven't ever heard any of the scholars say this. It's a form of one. 1,000 is not an adjective. 999 is. 1,000 is a noun, just like dozen is a noun. One dozen, two dozen would be 24 eggs or 24 something but but one dozen is one so that's what it is so you cannot have a thousand years I've never heard anybody even say this anything close to this the whole purpose of this not thousand years but at least 2,000 I don't know any Greek scholar never heard one of them say this I came up with this myself by looking at numbers. I had Mike, Mike was teaching up here at Ball State one time. I said, go into their, into their bookstore and see if they have anything on numbers, origin of numbers, etymology of numbers. They had some books. He got one for me and one for him. It's amazing what they say in these books. And this is mathematicians understanding numbers. I don't believe the scholars knew anything about numbers when they translated the 20th chapter of Revelation because they wouldn't have translated 1,000. The key to that is that God bound Satan, bound Dio. Didn't mean he tied him up somewhere. He forbid him. That's the same forbid Forbid, that's in opposition to Dio and Luo, meaning to loose. Dio means to forbid. God forbid Satan from deceiving the Gentiles for this so-called thousand-year period. I believe it has to be a 2,000-year period because, because Satan was bound from Acts 2 
This gives you kind of an idea where the end of time may be. For a 2,000 year period, and it was so he couldn't deceive the Gentiles, or it actually it says nations, but that's the same word as Gentile, ethnos. So there was a set of Gentiles for a 2,000 year period that cannot be deceived from Acts 2 until the end of time. That makes more sense. That was the whole purpose of Satan being forbidden. There's a group of Gentiles, and that's where Synecdoche would come in, a part as the whole. God's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh, but not every individual. That's Synecdoche. Just because you can't get some Greek scholar to agree with you, let me tell you some other things. I have never heard any Greek teacher, anyone, Talk about biblical algebra. Biblical algebra. Never heard anyone talk about biblical chemistry. I've taught on that. I've taught on the valence of an atom. Never, just because no Greek teachers taught on that doesn't mean it's not true. Never heard anyone talk about the eyes of the Lord and Israel being the apple of God's eye, the baba, the pupil. God is the great, God is the great chemist. If I had my life to do over, I would study all the physics and chemistry and biology I could study because I believe you got it all through the Bible. The biblical chemistry thing I did, that is an astounding thing. I went through some of it on the last message. And just because, Marshall, I don't agree with you at all. He says, Greek is one of the many languages that have grammatical gender, and you say it don't mean anything. What that means is, and you're just saying this is your opinion, nouns fit into three categories, masculine, feminine, and neuter. But that does not mean that these categories have any reference at all to real-life biological neuter, or real-life biological gender. I completely disagree with that. I believe genders are ordained by God. The reason we call them masculine, feminine, neuter, genders is because that's how they were labeled. That's your opinion. Categories long ago, but would just was okay to name them first, second, third endings. That's that's crazy. Or gay, for example, can only be feminine noun. That's right. When the Bible says, "So I swore in my wrath." That's not what it says. There in Hebrews 3.11, it says, So I swore in te, or gay, or g, Ada. Ada is feminine. It says, I swore in the wrath. It's not talking about God's future wrath like you say in this. It's talking about, it's talking about the wrath of the people. That holds true. Like I said, the concepts are true. When Babylon was the mother of harlots and they said, let us make us a name, that held true when you get down here to the wrath. It's feminine because Babylon was the mother of it all. That's why it's feminine. I, I can't answer this guy. He's got a whole bunch of opinions. I... Marshall, I appreciate your letter, but I think you're way off base. He says, or gay, for example, can only be feminine now, but that doesn't mean there is anything feminine about it. That's crazy. What do you mean nothing feminine about it? It's feminine. It's female. It's either the church sinning or it's... Babylon, Babylonian sinning. That's all the people there are in the world. That's a concept that holds true from beginning to end of the Bible. You can go check Strong's, Strong's and other lexicons. Strong's does not give you analytical 
concepts. You have to go into a parsing guide, an analytical lexicon. They show the word only feminine. You just don't believe that God inspired masculine, feminine, neuter, gender. I absolutely believe that. He inspired every jot and tittle throughout the Bible. I don't believe there's anything he didn't inspire. And I believe a lot of the translators, half the translators of King James Bible were wrong. They were Catholic. They don't believe in the NIV. Don't believe in the West Cotton Hort text at all. 6,500 words are left out of the West Cotton Hort. That's in the text of Sri Saptis. Don't have time to go on that. I have not heard anybody talk about that. No preachers. I have spent a lifetime studying these things. I don't go with anybody's statement of faith. My statement of faith is this book right here. The reason I believe predestination, it's in this book. And then I go to the definition. And then he says, yet make no comment in their definition. All you're doing is giving me opinions, Marshall. You're not telling me what is said and what is actual fact. It doesn't relate to women. It does not even to Babylon. To me, that's crazy. That's a concept that holds true. Babylon mothered it all. All idolatry came out of self. Let us make us up our own doctrine, our own name. Shem is the word. It means instruction. It means doctrine. I know you have a Bowers, Greek, English lexicon, and so forth. He says, see how they list with the Ada showing that it's feminine noun, but they have no problem attributing to God. And I believe they're wrong when they have no problem attributing feminine gender to God. He's not a female. I would sit in, and fight those so-called scholarly men say, you trying to tell me that God is a female. The hard thing about it, when the Bible says there in Hebrews 3 and 11, so I swore in the wrath. He's talking about the wrath of the people. The whole thing is about, it's talking about the people murmuring against God and Moses and Aaron for bringing them into the desert and leaving them out there to die. And it was their rage and their anger, not God's anger. God swore in their wrath that they wouldn't enter into his rest, talking about the promised land. And you can look at, you can look at Orge in the first chapter of Romans, and that tells you God placed the Orge upon unrighteous men. How did he place the Orge upon us? When he created Adam, he picked up the corrupt dust of the ground, made him out of that, and he had to sin. He said, thou shalt not, and the day you do, you will die. He didn't say, if you eat. No if to it. You will eat. I don't understand your thinking, Marshall, at all. It's uh, genders are inspired by God. I don't I don't believe you really have any understanding of it. Look at my DVDs on biblical chemistry and tell me God didn't inspire that. He inspired the one faith to be a foundation and he equated with the, with the sodium of sodium chloride which has one valence in it. And, and then the Valence, valence is the outer orbit of the electrons in an atom. And the valence of chlorine, which is deadly without being stable, it's deadly if you drink that. And sodium is just erratic. And once they bond together, and every atom is looking for another atom to bond with, and it stabilizes. And when you put the sodium with the chlorine, it becomes table salt. It stabilizes. Tell me that God didn't ordain that. He ordained every little small item you can think of. That's enough reading on that. Marshall, I'm not sorry to tell you, I just don't agree with you. 
just because you can find something by some Greek scholar doesn't mean that he's learned it. Every Greek teacher is teaching what he learned in his seminary when he got his doctor's degree. Did you know that? I don't even trust doctors. Like I've said, doctors do not do prognosis. Prognosis comes from the word pro and gnosis. Gnosis means knowledge. It means to know ahead of time. They don't know ahead of time. They do a prognosis. They are educated men and they do their education, they'll say, take these pills, and if that doesn't work, come back Monday, and we'll change your spark plugs and do a tune-up, okay? They do guesses just like everybody else. They're better guessers. They're educated guessers, but they're not educated knowers. They don't know exactly what's wrong with you. I'm, I've been around a long time. I've had a lot of experience with professors, Doctors of theology, very few of them I have any confidence in. And that's what's wrong with our nation and our world. We've got all these people that have fallen away from truth. Now, I really don't need any more of your comments, Marshall, because it's going to take a lot more than what you're saying to convince me. You didn't give me any really good Convincing word. I got one letter I'll read and then I'll get on with the program. One letter. This comes from Greg Cox is a dear follower of ours and he's in Washington, D.C. Been with us. Supports the ministry. Hi, Pastor Jim. Thank you for teaching and preaching the truth of God's word like you do. Thank you for sending the DVDs. According to Scripture, is hell a present reality? Well, Luke's the 16th chapter, the Bible says the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Oh, he was carried straight to hell. And Lazarus was carried to Abraham's bosom. Take a lot of explanation on that. Right now, or is it a future destination after the final judgment? No. It's something that people go to as soon as they die. YouTube scholar Mike Winger has stated that I understand. Don't call him a scholar. That means a learner. I understand that New Testament elect will remain asleep in their graves. And when Jesus turns to earth at the last trump, sleep was a term used for the dead in Christ. That was what it was used for. When Jesus went and healed Lazarus and and Jesus said, Lazarus sleepeth. And the apostles said, well, if he's asleep, he'll be okay. He'll wake up. And Jesus turned to him and said, Lazarus is dead. Do you understand that? <laughs> he said, it's that when G those that sleep in Christ, the only thing that sleeps is the body. The Jews said... I've got all these Jewish books and Jewish encyclopedias. And the Jews said, they said, the word hell is not the word hell. There was an old Baptist evangelist in the early eight, other 1900s. His name was Billy Sunday. And he was this fiery actor in a pulpit. He'd get up there and grab hold of the chair, raise it up in the air and say, it's not Hades, it's H-E-L-L, hell! Just a stupid guy. <laughs> the word is Hades. It comes from the word Ido and the alpha primitive. The way it's translated is Hades. There's no H's in the Greek. There's the diacritical mark, but we pronounce it a Hades, and it's the construction of Ido and the alpha privative, which is the negative particle. It means the hell means the place of the unseen, not seen. Ido means to see or perceive. That's what it means. The Jews said there were two places. For both 
both this is hell. He had a place for the spirit to go when it died. The people that were believers went to be with the Lord. And there was a place called a sepulcher where they buried the bodies. And all of this was called Hades or hell. It was all hell. That's the way the Jews said it was. This is a place of the unseen bodies and the place, and the only thing that was asleep was the bodies. These went to be with the Lord. Those are the ones he's going to bring back with him, but we'll not precede those that are asleep. We won't go out to meet him before those are asleep in Christ. He'll come back, hit, they'll, in a moment in the twinkle of an eye our eye twinkles about one billionth of a second you're not going to be able to see it happening it's going to be happening so fast and these bodies will come alive in Christ and go out to meet the Lord in the air with us hell there's, it does have some explanations to it but that's the way the Jews look at it alright that's enough of that. But anyway, I hope that'll help. Uh, help you, Greg. I understand the New Testament elect will remain asleep. No. Until Jesus returns. No, they've got two parts of them. Remember, death is the word thanatos. Thanatos, T-H. A-N-A-T-O-S. It means separation, not annihilation. So the, so the spirit separates from the body, which is put in a grave. That's death. Doesn't mean cease to exist. Pastor Jim, does this mean vessels of wrath are cast into hell right after they die? Absolutely. Or does everyone remain asleep in the grave until the final judgment? No. Not according to the Bible. And you have to know what the Jews believed about it. That's enough said. All right. I've been reading to you a little bit out of Mary. I'll just read a couple things to you out of Mary's books. And she's got three of these books. She goes on the Internet and gets these sayings. Mary's Collection of Quotations, Volume 1, 2, and 3. We're selling them just for about what it costs, $20 a piece, to have them printed. I'll read a couple of these. John, Jonathan Edwards says, True boldness for Christ transcends all. It is indifference to the displeasure of either friends or foes. I don't care what anybody thinks when I talk to them. I really don't care. If you can get about six people angry at you for what you're saying, one more or less won't matter. Just go ahead and get some people mad at you. And before it's over with, they quit getting mad and they just separate from you. Oh, hey, Chris, how you doing? I got a gun. I got to run. Excuse me. I can't talk now. They'll run. They'll separate from you. That'll be the death that you'll have. Bonus enables Christians to forsake all rather than Christ. When you forsake all, you don't care what anybody thinks. I don't. I don't care what anybody My doctors, I say anything I want to to them. And to prefer, but you know what? They respect me because I do that. They go, <laughs> some of them look at me like, wow, what a statement. And to prefer to offend all rather than to offend him. Jonathan Edwards, that's right, I don't care who I offend. But I cared who I offended when I was 35, not now. John Calvin, even if we were carefully to examine just one minute of our lives, we would find ourselves worthy of eternal death. And indeed, each one of us would discover ourselves to be sinners, not in just one area, but a 100,000 not due to some one fault, but to countless millions. Thank you, John Calvin. Man, I need to hear that. And then, uh, uh, let me see here. I've skipped through this and read many different things. 
The enjoyment of God is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. Jonathan Edwards, he was a brilliant man. I've read about him. He went off to college when he was 12 years old. He was a, had a genius mind. When you read Jonathan Edwards, you got to read real slow because he uses some big words. <laughs> you got to maybe have a dictionary close to you. How can you expect to dwell with God forever if you so neglect to forsake Him here? That's Jonathan Edwards. Let me see if I can. I've reread some of these, but I'll. Should I continue to stay in a church that has a woman as a pastor? Well, that church has no pastor. <laughs> I think that's funny. Because if a man desire the office of a bishop, let him be the husband of one wife. Now, how can she be the husband of one wife unless she's a lesbian? I don't know. The nature of Christ's salvation is woefully misrepresented by the present-day evangelist. He announces a Savior from hell rather than a Savior from sin. I like that because that's true. We're saved from ourselves. I preached a message on that. And that is why so many are fatally deceived. For there are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire who have no desire to be delivered from their carnality and worldliness. That was Arthur Pink who died in 1952. And how, how evil was the, there was no rock music in 1952. That didn't come out until about 54. Well, maybe a couple more of these if I can find them. Uh, Arthur Pink, growing in grace is a deepening realization of our nothingness. It is a heartfelt recognition that we are not worthy of the least of God's mercies. J.C. Ryle, except a man be born again, he will wish one day he had never been born at all. Whew, can you imagine God casting you into hell? Say, God, I wish I'd never been born. Man, that is really powerful. Except be born, man be born again. He'll wish one day had never been born at all. Man, I, people don't believe the Bible. That's enough reading. These are really good books. They got a really bunch of really good sayings in them. All right. We are on TV all over the country. We're on the Internet right now. We are live streaming. I've got people watching all over the world. And I want you to, to uh, pray for these people that God will make them strong. People call me from around the country and they say, I don't have anybody here in California or anybody in Texas or anybody in the Carolinas that I can fellowship with. And I tell them, watch us on the Internet Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time and then at 6.30 on Wednesday evening at Central Standard Time. And we've got some other people tuning in. We, we help a lot of these needy people. We send, I give away about 2500 sometimes up to $3,000 a month monies to the needy that can't help themselves. People like the lady out there in Loop, Texas, she just, she's having such a hard time. She's in a wheelchair. Her brother who's been taking care of her has got cancer and it's incurable. She don't know what to do. She says, I don't know what to do. I'm up against the wall. So we're going to give her a little more money every month. We've been sending her some money each month. People need help. If you want to give to the needy, make your check to Grace and Truth Ministries and put on the bottom of the check, tithe so much money and needy. Don't, don't take your tithe and give it to the needy. It takes a lot to run this ministry. 
we takes about forty six to forty seven thousand dollars every month for us to break even here. That's what it takes. So uh, we appreciate your help. Uh, just just uh, go according to your heart. I believe in tithing. I tithe. My wife tithes. I don't tell her what to tithe. She don't tell me. I give a tenth of what I make every month. All right. Well, let's pray. We've got people that are crippled. We've got people that are disabled. We've got people that are struggling. We've got about 20, 25 people we give to every month. And I'm going to keep doing that. I know what it's like to be poor. I was raised poor. And we're going to help them. Let's pray, Father, thank you for truth above everything. Lord, that's our liberation. We pray that you'll give us strength to continue. I need the strength, Lord, to help me so I can continue to preach this word. Lord, we'll give you praise for everything. Fight our battles for us. In Christ's name, amen. Two minutes. What is this two minutes stuff? <laughs> what is this two minutes? I never heard of two minutes. Have you noticed all it takes is getting real defined about everything? You can find out the truth. But you know what that takes? That takes your time at home to take these sources I give you into research. I never stop researching. I don't research around the clock, but I stay in a study mode all the time. If I think of something, I'll reach up at one of the books in my den or go upstairs and pull a book out. My house looks like a public library. I've got several thousand books, some of the best research material in the world. And I'm just, I'm just trying to find out what the truth is. I don't depend on anybody's statement of faith. I believe in the London Baptist Confession, but they've got water baptism in there that I don't believe in. That's the Baptist, and they got predestination, election all through it, but I still don't believe in water baptism. I believe there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and that's blood. That's death to self.
that's my favorite map. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm not new at this. I've been studying Bible since 1956 when I was 17 years old. I had some bad years where I was sick in the flesh, but God has really dealt with my heart to get back in the truth for the last 42, 43 years. I've saturated my, myself in the Greek text in the Hebrew language. I'm interested in what does the Bible actually say and mean. I'm not, I am not affected by any denomination. I don't even believe in denominations. The word denomination comes from the word D and nomos. D means to set off. Nomos is the Greek word law means to set off a law. If you believe in a Baptist denomination like I was raised, then if you step outside that statement of faith, they'll ostracize you and cut off fellowship with you and say, we don't want you talking about that here. Needless to say, the charismatics, I wouldn't get along with them. Five minutes, or let me put that correctly, five seconds, I would go into saying the tongues are not true and the faith healing is not true. I wouldn't get along with the Baptist and the Church of Christ because I'm going to tell them that water baptism is not true. Bab there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The Bible says that in Ephesians 4 and 5. Ephesians 4 and 5. You're not going to understand what that means, one baptism, unless you know the time factor when Paul wrote this to the Ephesians. It was approximately 55 A.D. In 33 A.D., that's when Jesus was crucified, approximately 33. Some people say 35. So Paul has been dead for at least 20 or 22 years. Uh, Paul, not Paul. Jesus had been dead 20, 22 years, 33 A.D., when he was nailed to the cross, nailed. All the rituals were nailed with him. He says that in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There's two handwritings, one on tables of stone, tables of stone, and one on fleshy tables of our hearts. Well, he's got to blot out one of these. He died, he's not going to blot out the one written on our hearts because we are a spiritual Israel. And on, flesh, on tables of stone, that's what's blotted out. So all the rituals and all the washings were blotted out when he was nailed to the cross. When they wanted to do away with one contract, I've said this a thousand times, and they wanted to establish another. They would take the contracting parties out in public, say, is everybody in agreement? They'd have even the two witnesses say, did you witness this original contract? They'd say, yes. And then they'd say, 
Are we in agreement to annihilate this? They say, yes, and I drive a nail through it, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which against us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So when Paul says there's one baptism, it has to be blood because there's no more water. They had all kinds of baptisms for their vegetables. It was a ritual. They also had proselyte baptism, proselyte, which was washing in water. And that's all been blotted out. So when you get to Ephesians 4 and 5, there's one baptism. And I keep saying this. Let me say this so you can get this into your craw, get it in, inside of you. Baptize, when you read the McClinican Strong and you look up baptize, it will say in the Mr. Strong is the same guy that produced the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Same man. And in his encyclopedia, you can get the McClinican Strong on the internet, all you have to do is take your search engine and put in McClintock and Strong, M-C-C-L-I-N-T-O-C-K, and Strong. And they'll come up with 12 volumes. And go to the B volume, and it will tell you that baptize not, this is the exact word of Mr. Strong, not being a verb implying motion now a verb an action verb implies motion throw jump run dip that's not baptism not being a verb implying motion and he'll turn right around and tell you that baptize come from a latin word tingo meaning to tinge and when you look up baptize, it will tell you in Strong's Concordance, it comes from baptizo and babto. There's something about this you really need to get inside your understanding. He even says at the end of the first paragraph that the grammatical construction of the word does not mean to immerse does not. Mr. Strong says that. Doesn't mean to immerse. It means to cover. Baptizo means to cover. And babto means to stain with a dye. What I want to get over to you is that, and he'll tell you that this word baptize was a verbal noun. Now I know what a verbal noun is. In English, a verbal noun is an infinitive. We get our word infinite from infinitive. Infinite. It means it never stops. There has to be a baptism that is permanent for the rest of your life and your existence. It's infinite, and it's a verbal noun, which is an infinitive. So it's there from now on. There's something about an infinitive you must understand. You must understand this. Did you know you can look this up on your cell phone? If you got an iPhone, just look up infinitive or look up verbal noun, and they will tell you on your iPhone that the fluid has to come from an outer source that comes from God upon the subject. Therefore, it cannot be H2O. God's not putting H2O upon people. What he's putting upon people is the blood. And anytime you see something about blood baptism, think. It has to, there has to be something from an outer source. When the Bible says in Romans, the first chapter, Revelation, the first chapter, he's washed. Think of that. He's washed. He did the washing. He's washed us from our sins. 
in his own blood. He did the washing. We don't do it. Every time you find this, find something that's showing he's, when the Bible says that John was on the Isle of Patmos and the angel come to him and he saw this great multitude around the throne of God and they were all clothed in white robes. And the angel asked John, this is in Revelation 7, do you know who these people are? And John said, I don't know. You know. Thou knowest. You tell us. He said, these are those who have made their robes white in the blood of Christ. Their robes is their clothing. Their robes are white in the blood. White is always a picture of purity in the Bible. Here's something really amazing. When your body, everybody here has got blood in their body. In your blood you have E-U-R-E-T-H-R-O-C-Y-T-E-S. Erythrocytes and leukocytes. And these disc-like cells, hemoglobin carries these throughout your body, hemoglobin. And the leukocytes are white blood cells. Erythrocytes are red blood cells. And the white blood cells are produced by the red blood cells. The same thing as our robes are white in the red blood of Christ. Now that's nothing but astounding to me. I got that out of Eric, my son's, high school biology book. I mean, there's no telling where you can find information. Besides that, nobody ever studies every page of a 12th grade biology book. Nobody. And I used it to look it up, and I thought, Phew. it's just amazing to me. Now, I'm talking about blood baptism Blood baptism, let me, read some, let me read something to you on blood baptism. I got this out of Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion. And it's got as the title, Baptism by Blood. A blood baptism was a death. That's death to self, a daily cross, self-denial. That's what it is. You get to the place where you don't care. Where does a blood baptism come from? Where does death to self come from? Remember, death means separation, not annihilation. So people will separate from you when you say truth to them. You tell them Christmas is pagan, God doesn't love everybody, uh, all these holidays are pagan, you got to have to have a daily cross, deny self, you have to be born again, which makes you a new creature. You have to be somebody you used to not know. Me and Mary were riding home one night, and she said, I saw something tonight I've never seen. I said, what's that? She said, you have to become somebody that the old you wouldn't recognize. I said, that's exactly right. Now, let me say, let me read this. Baptism by blood. This is out of Hastings Encyclopedia Religion. That's that 13 volume set over there. And you can look it up and look up blood baptism in the index volume. They got an index volume. It's got everything under the sun in it. Two uses of the expression blood baptism must be distinguished. A literal use as applied to the practices of pre-Christian and ethnic religion and a metaphorical denoting the sufferings of the Christian martyrs. They're dying. Boy, that, that's, you know why people don't like this? This hurts. Literal use. Among all the primitive races, the blood of beasts or of men plays an important part in religious ceremonies. In the East especially, it is a peculiar purgative 
and propitiatory properties ascribed to it as being the seat and vehicle of life, talking about blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus seventeen eleven. The ancient Arabs sprinkled blood to lay evil to lay evil spirits. I've got a paper here and it's got every time the word sprinkled sprinkling blood all through the Bible, all through the Old Testament, it's about thirty seven or thirty eight times. I can't find the thing. But it's about 37 or 38 times that sprinkle is used. And then you've got sprinkling about 40-something times. That's what we're, where you can go over to the 26th chapter of Exodus and Moses sprinkled the people with the blood of the Lamb. He sprinkled the people. That's true baptism. Except that was a shadow and the New Testament's the very image that's the real. Let me read some more of this. Hebrew notions concerning blood were so far spiritualized that there is only one instance in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 22 and 38. Hellenic ritual is not without... Hellenic means Greek ritual is not without examples of cathartic, cathartic meaning to cleanse, sprinkling of blood, metaphorical use. In the Christian church, allusion is very early made to baptism by blood in connection with being a martyr dying. I've never heard a preacher even preach on this. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood? Of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Well, that's all biblical. Can you see that? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? Polycarp, A.D. 156, who stripped himself of his garments at the stake, may very well have wished to signify by doing a preparation by baptism by blood and fire. I've read other articles on that where Polycarp, who followed uh, John as pastor of the church at uh, Smyrna, that he, that he said, when he walked up to the stake, he said, now I shall drink the cup of my Lord. He knew what drinking a cup was. It was dying. It was probably not the first time that a Christian martyr tried to carry out in his own person the prophecy of Mark 10, 39, where Jesus said, can you be baptized with a baptism I'm baptized with, talking about his death the next day. The germ of the idea, the death of Christ, had the effect of baptism. Two things confer forgiveness of sins. Baptism in blood and the suffering for Christ. But the first definite mention of baptism by blood in Christian literature is probably a passage in 2002 by Passio Perpetu. It talks about sanguine, which is the word blood. This is it's a very interesting thing on blood baptism. I never heard any preacher, no Baptist I ever, ever around, ever talk about blood baptism. Yet my encyclopedias are full of it. Don't listen to these professors. I don't, there's very few professors of theology that I believe in. Now, I want to explain something to you I've been trying to explain. I keep putting this on the board. The beginning of the gospel is the Bible says is let's go over here to to mark the first chapter verse 1 I want to try to get this over to you so you'll understand it mark 1 1 the gospel is not what preachers are saying I have got one guy writing to me, calling me granddad, grandpa, and insulting me, saying, 
You don't know what the gospel is. The gospel is good news, you ignoramus. Gospel is the word A-U-A-G-G-E-L-O-S. It's actually euangelion, A-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-O-N. Excuse me, I've got it wrong. The word gospel is the word euangelion. The word preach the gospel Preach the gospel is the word euangelizo. This guy that writes, but he doesn't, you don't have any idea that there's something called a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It has every word in the Bible listed alphabetically. You could look it up and find out what it means by looking it up alphabetically. It'll start with the first time it's mentioned in the Old Testament, go all the way through. If it is a New Testament word, there'll be a number to the right of it. And you take that number and look it up in the Greek dictionary in the back. Look that number up. It'll tell you how to pronounce it, how it's spelled, how it's pronounced in the English, how it's spelled in the Greek. And it'll give you a basic definition. You want to know what gospel is? I hear preachers talk about, we preach the gospel. Let him know what they're talking about. The gospel is the baptism. It is the narrow way. The Bible specifically states that. This guy wants to tell me, you, you don't have, you can't have a strong concordance because you keep writing to me saying, you don't know nothing about the gospel. It's the good news. And that's all you got to say. Euangelizo comes from you, meaning good or well. And angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Angelos is our word angel, but it merely means messenger. So gospel means the good message of God. But the good message, there's a beginning of the gospel. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8. Jesus is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance, all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. You've got to obey the gospel. There is a beginning to the gospel. That word beginning is RK. We get our word Ark from that. Ark. An ark of a circle is the beginning of a circle. When you finish this, the ark, what you have is a complete circle. It is the beginning. The beginning of the gospel. If there's a beginning, there's a continuing of the gospel. Continuing of the gospel. And I've already told you this, but let's look at it one more time. If you don't, and the Strong's Concordance is merely the beginning of a study of Greek words. I've got Kittle's New Testament Dictionary of Greek Words. That's 10 volumes, a 10 volume set. You, I look up the Greek word in it, and it will tell me that the word agape There are 34 pages just on the word agape. Just on that. In Kittle's dictionary. There's 10 volumes to Kittle's dictionary of New Testament Greek words. Just 34 pages completely on agape. And you've got to do a lot of reading to find out how they looked at it. It'll tell you agape in Old Testament times. It'll tell you agape according to the rabbinical understanding. I don't ever stop. I haven't quit reading these 34 pages. I look at them over and over and over. 
I've got them printed out. I make copies of them, and I go back and review them over and over, and I'm going, well, there's so much to this. Now, I'm trying to show you, look over here and mark the first chapter. I want to say this slow today so I can help you understand. Mark the first chapter. If there's a beginning of the gospel, it's the beginning of euangelion. It's the beginning of euangelion. That is the word gospel. If somebody asked you to explain the gospel, what would you say to them? Resurrection. Well, that's putting it very mildly. Very mildly. Say resurrection. Very mild. What, who is, what is the resurrection of? Huh? I, it's the resurrection of Christ in us. That's what it is. It's the basic narrow way. I'm going to give you something today I haven't given you. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written. Oh, the gospel is written somewhere besides the New Testament. As it is written in the prophets. And here it is. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which they shall prepare thy way before thee. Prepare hetoimos. Hetoimos means to set up. It, and God says he set this up in advance before the foundation of the world. Which he prepared the way of the Lord. The word way is hodos. There's only two ways. There is a narrow way. So the narrow way is the beginning of the gospel, isn't it? That's just where the gospel begins. Is the narrow way. Let me read the rest of this. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Where is this written? Well, for one thing, it's written several times, but the main place I love to go to is Isaiah 40 and 3. The gospel was prepared you the way of the Lord. When you go to Isaiah 40 and 3, look over there real quick. Isaiah 40. This is the gospel is written by the prophets. Isaiah 40, here's the gospel. I want you to learn this. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. That's John the Baptist, wasn't it? Prepare ye the way. Oh, well, the word way in Mark, the first chapter, that second verse, that word way is hodos. This word way in Isaiah 40 and 3 is the word derek. D-E-R-E-K. We get our word direction from that. Therefore, anytime you see direct in the Old Testament, you can say it is the hodos of the new, can't you? You see that? You can see it's the hodos of the new. It's the narrow way of the New Testament. So he says... This is where it's written. Let's read it. Prepare you way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. What is he talking about? He's talking about Isaiah and Jeremiah are talking about Israel being carried away into captivity. How many times have I said this by the Assyrians and by the Babylonians? Because of all the time they'd gone after idol gods. Notice this always goes back to Baal and the grove and all this. The narrow way goes back to this. They're carried off into captivity. And Isaiah is saying, 
you got to prepare a highway back to Jerusalem so you can rebuild the temple of God that Cyrus has given you decrees to go rebuild the temple and then Artaxerxes is going to give you, going to give you uh, ways to go rebuild the city, give you a decree to re go rebuild the city there in Nehemiah the second chapter. This is talking about the way back to rebuild the city and the temple that has been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Notice you don't ever get away from the same subject. The subjects are constant all the way through the Bible. The concepts are always the same. They connect with one another. So the narrow way has to do with preparing a highway. Why did they have to prepare a highway? Because they didn't have any highways built. If any of you have ever gone out in the country and it, where it's been raining real hard and there was no paved roads, my grandfather had a had a farm about 30, 40 miles outside of Fort Worth. And we'd go out there. This was back in the 40s when there was no pavement hardly anywhere. Very few paved roads. And we'd get out on one of those country roads and when it had been raining, rocks would be jutted up out of the ground. And it just, I mean, it was like, Miserable traveling on those roads. That's exactly the way it was with these people. There was only one system that built roads. That was Rome. They, they, they had a saying, all roads lead to Rome. And the roads that they made, they had one main highway that went to Rome. It was called the Appian Way. That was the Appian Highway. And they had, unless Rome built things, they didn't care nothing about Israel. They wasn't going to build highways for them. So Israel is over here in Babylon, and God is saying, build a highway back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God. That's what he's saying here. We are the temple of God. We've been devastated by this world. And the Bible says agape... Walking in the commandments of God, agape, there in 1 Corinthians 8 and 1, agape edifieth. The word edify is the word oiko, O-I-K-O, D-O-M-E-O. -E Instead of going over here to, over here to build a literal temple, what we have to do, we have to walk in the commandments of God. Agape, Second John 6, this is love, this is agape, that we walk after his commandments. You cannot, you cannot interchange phileo and agape. Phileo means to have affection. We can only have affection for our brothers when they're doing the things of God, walking in agape, Second John 6. So, agape edifies, oikodomeo, Oikos and Dome. Oikos is house, and the house of God was the temple of God. But that's been leveled and brought to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar. So when we walk in God's commandments, Oikos. Dome. Dome is the word roof. When they finished the roof of a house, they said the house was finished. Agape edifies, builds up the house of God. Instead of building a highway or a way or a hados, God has given us a narrow way to rebuild the house of God that's been destroyed by the world. That's what this is about. Let's read the rest of it. And I can't get into all of this because there's so much to it. Let's read the rest of this. He says the same things in Mark 1 and in Luke, the third chapter. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. I like that because... I've given you this many times. The word humble, T-A-P-E-I, 
N-O-O. Tepanua means to level mountains and hills. There's two mountains in the Bible. There's Babylon, a destroying mountain. God says Babylon within you has to be leveled. She was founded on self. Let us make us a name. Make us a name. Let us make us a name. That's Tepanua, to level the mountain of self. And there is the, the God's mountain, Zion. Zion means sunny, has the basic same meaning as horizo, horizon, sunny. That's what Zion means. And that is God's mountain. And God says, listen to this mountain. Don't listen to this mountain. If you'll say to this mountain that argues with me, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And let's read on here. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The man who abases himself will be lifted up and exalted. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. Now look back over here at Mark. Sounds like Mark is repeating what Isaiah said. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way, the highway back to God when you've been destroyed and carried off by Babylon, by self. That's what, this is all very figurative language. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Now, I want you to notice this is the exact same thing as a blood baptism. I have said this over and over. But if you notice, the gospel is the narrow way. Prepare you the way. There's one way. That's God's way, and that's the narrow way. The Thalibo, the Thalipsis, the Thalibo way. Thalibo. That's the word narrow. This is amazing because these translators have not translated this quite correctly. When I say the narrow way, if I said the narrow way, the narrow way. In English, in English, that would tell what kind of a way. That would actually be an adjective modifying way in English. That's not what it is in the Greek. That is a verb in the Greek. It is a verb meaning to press, to press or pressure someone or something. To pressure. It's like it's a narrow opening, like a turnstile. It's just you and God when it comes time to go through the narrow way. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Straight. Stenos. And then you have a verb form. Stenos is a noun. And stenazo is the verb. And you'll find that over in Romans 8 more than anywhere else where the Bible says we groan. The reason we are groaning is because we are pressured on all sides about people pressuring us because they don't like what we're standing for. They don't like the idea we say Christmas is pagan, God doesn't love everybody. They don't like the idea we're saying without a daily cross you can't go to heaven. That you have to deny self. That's a command from God. They don't like that. So they're pressuring us from all sides. That's And we are in a groaning process. Boy, I love that over there in, in uh, Romans 8 when the Bible speaks of groaning. It's the verb form of straight. While we're being pressured by the world, this is what we're doing. We're having a hard time 
and we get weary and tired. Do you think Paul was having a hard time running for his life? And they were trying to kill him everywhere he went. Have they done that to you yet? Is anybody trying to kill you? Is anybody trying to destroy your life because of what you believe? When you look over here in Romans 8, he's talking right right before he gets down here to Romans 8, 29. These verses have to do with that. He says, for we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth. Creation is not talking about evil people. We are new creatures, which is this basic same word as creation. That's the word katesis. We are new creatures in Christ. So this is not talking about unbelievers. In fact, you can refer back to verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity and not willingly. That's talking about Adam was made subject to worthlessness. Matiotes, M-A-T-A-I-O-T-E-S, M-A. T-A-I-O-T-E-S. He was made subject to worthlessness, but it wasn't by Adam's will, but not willingly, but by reason of God. It says him who hath subjected Adam, it says the same, in hope. So that's the creation. Creation is when people are not created in Christ, they're chaos. And then he says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth. It's, it's got an addition to stenazo. It's got sustenazo, sustenazo. Su comes from sum. It means in fellowship we're groaning. We're groaning in fellowship together. That's why it's good to get together all that we can because the world is going to hate us for what we believe. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it'll hate you. He told the apostles that. And then he says in verse 23, For we know not, we, we know, we not only, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown, stenazo, it's the verb form of straight is the gate. We groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies when he changes our bodies and gives us a new body and there's no more of this groaning. And then he says down here in verse, in verse 26, likewise the spirit, the truth that's in us also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought to pray. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession into Kano. E-N-T-U-G. E-N-T-U-G-C-H-A-N-O. Into Kano means to intercept when your life is getting too hard and God knows it's more than you're going to be able to take, He intercepts you. He knows when you've had all you can take in a given situation. So what He does, He intercepts you. That word intercede, it's like, I've used this illustration so many times, if you're riding down the road in your car here, you're coming to this intersection. You see a car coming from down this road here. And it looks like it's going to hit this little kid. Then that car will come up and knock you off that path. That's an intercession. The word in the Old Testament is pagal. Intercession. It means to impinge progress. God will stop you from going a certain direction when you're going somewhere where it's going to be where you can't handle it. You can handle more than you think you can. 
I mean, we've all handled more than we thought we could. There were years that I thought, oh, God, I'll die if I can't have what I want. You can't just, you can't just have your way. If y'all can turn that off, I appreciate it. I can't. I've kind of lost my place here. All right. Now, now let's read the rest of this. Likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know that we, we know not what we would pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh his intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That word is the word stenogmos. It is a form of the word stenos. It means we're groaning together. Stenogmos. Stenos is the stem of the word agmos. So we don't, we are groaning. This has to do with the straight and the narrow way. And that's the gospel. That's the beginning of the gospel. Now, let's go over here to, that's why he says, that's why he says in verse 28, and we know that all these things that's causing us to groan are working together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The called is God's church, God's called out, God's elect. All this groaning, this straight and narrow way is for our good. That's what he's saying here. And then he says, for whom he did foreknow. Whom is the ones that are groaning. That's who he foreknew. Whom he did prognosco. I preached on this before, but and I didn't mean to get in it today. But I love this with predestination. Because whom he did foreknow, the ones... The ones that he foreknew are the ones that's groaning. They're in the straight and narrow way. They're having a miserable time in life. We got a lot of people that are having a miserable time. Don't think you're having such a miserable time until you're in a wheelchair and you can't get around. And you can't drive. And you can't and you're having a hard time existing and living. You can't pay your bills. Don't think you're having as hard a time as this lady out there in Luke, Texas. She, she just, I have other people say, I don't know how I can live. I have a couple of guys out in, in, in homes, nursing homes. They don't know how they're going to live and get by. One makes $500 a month. And the rent that they charge eats up all of that. He has nothing left. And we send him about $100 a month. When you think you're having a hard time, you ain't having a hard time at all. Not compared to some people. I can give you names of people and you can call them and they'll cry the blues to you like you ain't never heard. You're not having a hard time compared to them. You can walk, can't you? You can drive, can't you? You can go buy groceries, can't you? They can't. Just stop and think how God has blessed you if you can walk around and you can buy groceries and eat and pay rent. Yeah, but I don't have a nice apartment. They don't have nothing out there. Some of them just have nothing. My heart goes out to all of them. I want to pick up everybody. If I could, I'd build a, a thing that looked like a motel out here, out in the country, I'd bring a bunch of these people here and pay their way until they died because they're never going to have anything. The best thing I can do is send them $100, $200, $300. And that's what our benevolent fund is for. So they're really groaning. And some of them are saying, I really believe in love predestination, but boy, I'm having a hard time. Have you been there? I've been there. When I was young, I didn't know what to do. I was just lost as a goose at 19 and 20 years old. Didn't know what I was going to do. And then he says, for whom? Who is the whom? The ones that's groaning. 
whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image, the icon, the likeness of Jesus. Do you think he was having fun? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He didn't laugh and tell jokes. He was having a hard time. He was loving his people and they were crucifying him. Now, let's get back over here to, let's go back over to, I, what I'm, I'm introducing you to the beginning, to the RK. That's the beginning. The beginning of the, of the gospel, the euangelion. That's the word gospel, E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-O-N. Euangelion, if this is the beginning, there has to be a continuation of the gospel in our lives. And the beginning of the gospel is the same thing as the blood baptism. Let's look at it over here in Luke 3. I'm having to go back through this and introduce you to it because I'm going to say some things I haven't said before. Luke 3. Look here in verse 2. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John the, John the Baptist, the son of Zacharias as in the wilderness. Zacharias was, he was a high priest. That was John the Baptist's father. And he came into the country about Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance. The fact that it says baptism of repentance means that cannot be water. Baptism Of repentance. When you look up of repentance, it's one word. And it will tell you that it is genitive case. Genitive case. That means baptism is owned and possessed by repentance. A man that has true repentance, he is being baptized with the blood of Christ. This cannot possibly be water. John baptized in water. That was a proselyte process. Now, here's the baptism of repentance. As it was written in the book of Isaiah. Same thing that Mark 1 was talking about. The baptism of repentance is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the hodos, the narrow way. So blood baptism is the same thing as the beginning of the gospel, which is prepare ye the way. These two are equal to one another. The blood baptism is prepare ye the narrow way. This all goes back to Matthew 7, 13, 14. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. The word destruction is apolia, A-P-O-L-E-I-A. It's the same word as lost. It's like the person that's lost and going to hell. It's the basic same word as Apollo me, which means to be destroyed or lost. As it is written in the book of Isaiah. So Notice Mark said, as it's written in the prophets, but it's the same words. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Prepare ye the highway of the Lord, prepare the hodos of the Lord, prepare the direct, 
and go back and build the house of God that's been destroyed in you through sin. That's a Babylonian attitude, sin. That's when you decide, I'm going to make me a name and do what I want to do. Now, let me give you something. I'm going to go into this. I'm going to give you every time that word, thalibo, which is the word narrow, is in the Bible. First of all, let me give you the biblical definition of it. Thalibo is the word narrow over there in Matthew 7. 14, straight is the gate and narrow, the libo, is the way. This is the pathway to rebuild the house that's been destroyed in us through sin. It takes a long time to walk in agape, agape edifies and builds up the house of God. Remember that? I just put that on the board. Agape, walking in God's commandments. Agape was a relationship that kings had for their subjects, that fathers had for their families. They gave them laws. When they loved their king, they willingly walked in his commandments. That's what builds up the house of God. Whose house are we? We are God's temple. You know what builds up the house of God? To put it plainly, a hard time. <laughs> That's the only thing that'll build you up. God has to rip you down first. He's got to just level that old temple and give you a hard time. Now look over here, Matthew 7 14. Let me give you this, Thalibo. It te it'll tell you it's a form of Philipsis. Let me erase some of this so I can write on the board. Thalibo is a form of thalipsis. One is the verb thalibo. That'll be the verb form. It doesn't look like a verb, narrow. It looks like an adjective in the English. Well, it would be. When they translate it, they translate it as something you can understand. Now, you may not know the difference between an adjective and a verb. Adjective tells which, what kind of, how many, and modifies nouns and pronouns. A verb shows action. This word, thalibo, shows an action that's happening in your life. This is the narrow way. Let me give this to you. It means thalibo and thalipsis. I'm going to give you Thalipsis and Thalibo. Now, Thalibo is mentioned ten times in the New Testament, but it's not all, it's never narrow again. It's only narrow one time. You can get this out of, out of Word Study Concordance, right here. You've probably got this on the internet. A word study concordance. It'll tell you how many times a word is mentioned and tell you, it'll tell you what word it is in various, and you'll see that this word thalibo has a verbal movement to it. It means to press. Do you feel pressured by the world? You know what makes you overcome that? Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. That's the word delipsis. But he said, I have overcome the world. You're going to have tribulation. Every time the word tribulation is mentioned, it is this word. Thalipsis. Every time. Now there's some other words that have been translated that are thalipsis, but every time tribulation is mentioned, it is the noun form of the narrow way. And I know this is all uncomfortable, but it's, preachers need to tell people this. Of course, all they're telling them is God's going to give you money and make you well and give you everything you want if you just tie it to this church. 
I'm not going to promise you anything. Now, that word thalibo means to rub together, to constrict, which is a verb. It means to constrict. That's what a narrow way does to you. Constrict you. You know what a boa constrictor is, don't you? Wraps around you and tightens up. This tightens you up as far as what you can do. Means to constrict, to press together, figuratively, oppressively, to afflict and to distress. I.e., like when circumstances rub us the wrong way. Somebody don't like what you're saying, that rubs you the wrong way. That's not your fault. That's what your job is. That make us feel confined and restricted in a narrow place. You're you're forbidden in a sense to get out of the narrow way. And then you've got here in I want to give you, you got the word narrow in Matthew 7, 14. I want you to go to Mark 3 and verse 9. Here's this same word again. Mark 3 and verse 9. And I'll start reading in verse 7. Jesus withdrew himself from his disciples to the sea and a great multitude of Galileans followed him from Judea and from Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto Jesus. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude lest they should throng him. Throng is the word thalibo. They're pressuring him. It's hard. That's, this gives you a, an illustration of what it means. It means spiritually the narrow way is going to throng you. It's going to pressure you from all sides. And it's not always going to be fun. I'm not sorry to tell you that. Preachers don't tell people this, do they? Look over here in 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Now, I'm just giving you Thalibo today. I'm not going to give you Thalipsis till next time. This is just Thalibo. 2 Corinthians 1. And verse... I'm going to have to read down to this. Whew. Man, I'll have to put some philipsis in here. Let's start reading here in verse 4. Speaking of Christ who comforts us in all of our tribulation, philipsis. <coughs> that philipsis, let me read the definition to you of philipsis. This is the official definition. Philipsis. Pressure. What constricts or rubs together, used of a narrow place that hems someone in. You're hemmed in by the world, by the world hating you. But you can't get mad at them because that's what they're supposed to do. And this is what's going to make you like Jesus. Tribulation especially internal pressure, what you feel inside that causes someone to feel confined or restricted. Philipsis, compression, carries the challenge of coping with internal pressure. Do you ever feel that? You're supposed to. But you're supposed to say this is the will of God, especially when feeling there is no way of escape. ooh we. You ever been in that kind of situation? It has never really been as hard on most of us as some people in the world. 
who comfort us in all tribulation that we may be able to comfort them. Comfort. Parakaleo. P-A-R-A-K-A-L-E-O. Remember Kaleo? To call near. Para, we get our word parallel. It means to call them near to us and hug them and say, hey, you're one of us. You are one of the elect. You're one of the predestinated. And I love you, brother. Now, they may not have it together, but you're not supposed to get mad at them because they don't have it together like you do. But if you think you have it together, you don't have it together as good as you think. That you may be able to comfort them which are which are in any trouble. Thalipsis. That's the word thalipsis. It's a form of the narrow way. You're going through the narrow way when you're troubled. That's what it's about. I've been where I didn't think I was any way out. Boy, 1968, 69, 70, 71, 72, and 73. I thought I was going to die, but I didn't. And I came out of it. By the comfort wherewith, the comfort, parakaleo, wherewith we ourselves are comforted. And the Bible says the scripture is what comforts us, calls us to him. For as the sufferings, pathema, P-A-T-H-E-M-A, comes from the word pathos, a pathological doctor is a doctor of suffering diseases. <laughs> That's the suffering that we're going through. And as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, they're there. But it's of Christ. And it's a wonderful thing we get to get out of this one day. So our consolation, paraclesis, it's a form of comfort. P-A-R-A. P-A-R-A-K. L-E-S-I-S comes from kaleo and para. Means calling near. The what verse was I in? Six? Five? As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. You're supposed to be consoled in Christ and not in this world. And whether we be afflicted, Philebo, you're in the narrow way, and it's hard, and it's tough. And that's the beginning of the gospel. How long do you have to stay in this gospel? Till the day you die. How long you got to stay in the narrow way? Just pray, Lord, come and get me out of this as soon as you can. If you want to. <laughs> And whether we be afflicted, the labo, that's a form of the word narrow. It is the word, the same word as narrow. It is for your paraclesis, consolation and salvation. He's saying, I'm preaching to you at Corinth for your salvation. I'm trying to tell you what you're supposed to go through. Now, what we need to do is go back to the 18th chapter of Acts and study the problems that Paul had at at Corinth. Corinth was an apostate church. They were arguing with each other constantly. Even the believers couldn't get along at Corinth. That was one of the worst churches in all of these letters that Paul writes to. Which is effectual in the enduring. Enduring is the word hupomone. Hupo. Monet. It's a form of hupo meno. Hupo meno is the word patience. The trying of your faith, all of this fiery trial you're going through, 
is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. If the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely mogus means with great difficulty. What do you think all this tribulation we're going through is about? It's about your being like Christ. It's hard, isn't it? This is not something most of us want to look at and live with, but it's what is required of us as believers. Enduring the sufferings, verse 6. Enduring the sufferings, which we also suffer, pathema, whether we be comforted, parakaleo, called near to God, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings at Corinth, boy, they needed a lot of, they were arguing with each other. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm, I, I'm following Jesus, but you are a bunch of foolish people. So shall you also be of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble. Philipsis. We're having all kinds of trouble and tribulation as we're going to all these churches of Asia. And they run me out of town at Iconium. And then I got down to Derby, Lystra, and they tried to kill me and threw all these stones at me. And then they, I had to escape over a wall one time in a basket. Have you ever had a hard time like Paul yet? And we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure Pressed out is the word bareo, B-A-R-E-O. Means the load was so heavy. Means it's heavy. I couldn't hardly take it. He said, we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired of life. Have you ever been to the place well, there's no way out and you just wanted to die. That's what he's saying. The spirit of life is the word X A P O R E O M A I. Remember the word of porio? That's the word when the Bible says at the end of time there'll be distress of nations with perplexity. No way out. Exoporeal my means absolutely no way out. How does that make you feel? You're running for your life, going down over a wall in a basket. The Pharisees are after you. They're saying, kill him, kill him. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Boy, it reminds me of the 11th chapter of this book. Do I have any time, Mike? Look at the 11th chapter of this book. This is what Paul had to go through. Now you've got to remember, he's a man on the run. He's been chased out of town every time he gets someplace by the Pharisees, and they're trying to kill him. And They finally get him to Rome, and they relieve him of his head. They cut his head off. Would you like to be the Apostle Paul? Just think about the problems you have. There's nowhere to even be close to this. In this 11th chapter, Paul says here, I love this whole chapter. He's talking about some that come preaching another Jesus, another spirit. Another gospel would be another way, which is not the narrow way. And then he says in here, in verse 16, 
I say again, let no man think of me as a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, I'm going to talk like a moron, a mo, a moriah, M-O-R-I-A. Comes from the word morose. Anytime the Bible speaks of a fool, we are fools for Christ. It means we're morons in the eyes of the world to say that Christmas is pagan, to say that God does not love everybody. You got to be crazy to say that. And then he says, Yet as a fool will receive me, that's the way I want you to receive me, that I may boast myself a little. I'm going to talk like these foolish people in the world talk. That which I speak, I speak not after the Lord. But as I were a foolish man, and this confident of uh, boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly. People who are morons, you suffer them, you allow them. Seeing you yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage. If a man devour you, if a man take of you, you put up with it. I'm in verse 20. If a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach, infamy. Aniedzo, remember that? I'm an infamous man. That as though we had been weak, how be it, how be it, whensoever any is bold, I am bold also. But we know that. I, bold, parhesia, means to speak plain. Paul don't beat around the bush. Are they Hebrews? So am I. He's talking about these men that are coming preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. He says they're Satan's preachers. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? Even though they are, Jesus told the Pharisees, Abraham's not your father. Satan is your father. The works of your father you will do. So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more than these preachers that are preaching this other gospel, this other Jesus, this other way. I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundance. In stripes above measure. The most that the Romans could beat a man was 40 times. So what they would do, they would beat him 39 times save one. So they didn't go over because if they went over 40 stripes, the man that beat them had to receive the same thing. They had a strict law. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, he had seen many people die. Of the Jews, five times received die, 40 stripes save one, 39 stripes. Of the Jews, they beat him five times. And they used that cat of nine tails. The cat of nine tails was a little short whip, had pieces of leather on it, and they had pieces of glass and bone in that. He said, they beat me five times with that. Do you think that Paul had every right to say the things that he would say about the narrow way? Thrice was I beaten with rods. That was a Roman way of beating people. Once I was stoned. That was when he was at when he was on that first missionary journey. He went from Antioch to Iconium to Lystra. He was at Lystra when they stoned him and left him for dead. I keep saying, when they stoned somebody, they didn't throw rocks at him. They took him up on a high precipice, threw him down, hoping it'd break their neck or their back, maybe 20 or 30 feet high. If it didn't, they'd throw big boulders at him, 20, 25, 30 pounds. That was the stoning. It looked like Paul had been on a camel riding about 60 miles an hour running into a brick wall. 
That's what he looked like. You can read about his stoning there in that 14th chapter of Acts. That's when he made the statement, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. And he says, three times I suffered shipwreck. He suffered shipwreck there on the island of Melita in the 28th chapter of Acts. That's when a Mediterranean viper grabbed hold of him. I've studied about the Mediterranean viper. They have fangs that are curved inwards and they hang on. And the Bible says it hung on to Paul. It hung on to his skin. And the natives said he must be evil that this has happened to him. And he didn't swell up. That's what the Bible means when he's in the 16th chapter back says you'll take up serpents. He's talking about these deadly serpents wouldn't hurt the apostles because the Bible was in the making. It was being written. He didn't swell up and they said you must be a god. He said I'm not a god. That was one of the miracles given to the apostles. A night and the day I've been in the deep. It's talking about being in the bottom of a ship while it's storming. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils, this word peril means dangers. In dangers of robbers, in dangers by my own countrymen trying to kill me. In perils or dangers in the heathen, in dangers in the city. Everywhere he went, they were trying to kill him. In dangers in the wilderness, in dangers in the sea, in perils in false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness when I didn't have any clothes to put on. Beside those things, that are without that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches. Then I've got people like you, Hymenaeus and Philetus, preaching a doctrine that eats like a canker over there at Ephesus. You doing this. Can't you guys back off and stop? I've got enough from the world out here without preachers running me down. I can say that with Paul. I've got enough to do without people writing me and running my, my understanding of the Bible down. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I am not lying. Tough time. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. The government was trying to get me. They finally caught him, took him to Rome, and they tell us that in the custom was that Paul was beheaded at Rome. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Boy, what a way to go. Now, back to Second Corinthians, the first chapter. Talking about I was pressed out of measure, I despaired of life. No way out. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from great death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Then he says, He also helping together by prayer for us, for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many to our, on our behalf. And then he goes on to say, God has delivered me. Now, 
Let me give you the next time. This 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 chapter here and the next chapter. Do I have any time, Mike? Yeah. All right. Chapter four of Second Corinthians is one of my favorite chapters on on this narrow way. What we're talking about is the narrow way. This is the beginning of the gospel. If you're not in the narrow way, you're not in the gospel. If you're not suffering for Christ, if you're not telling people the truth and they're giving you a hard time about it, they're supposed to give you a hard time. Is God going to bring you out of it? Yeah. You're going to have to stay with it all the way through the end. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it all the way to the day of Jesus Christ. Don't feel alone. We all suffer for taking a stand. If you're not suffering for a stand, that's because God hasn't made you strong enough yet to take a stand. And all you'll do is you'll be you'll be friends with the world and that makes you God's enemy. So God's got to beat you that much more. We have no way out. Have you figured that out yet? Look here in Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. This has been one of my favorite chapters on the narrow way ever since I have been teaching on this. Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter. I love this. Fourth chapter. And I don't hear preachers preach on these verses, do you? And tell people the real truth about them. In verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The earthen vessels is us. And we are troubled. Philebo. In the narrow way on every side, yet not distressed. Steno Korea. Steno. We're troubled but not distressed. I'm, we're talking about what is the narrow way? What is the gospel? It, was, it began when you entered into the straight gate, pressed on every side, and all these problems come upon your life, and it's supposed to be that way. Steno. That comes from stenos, which is the word straight. C-H-O-R-E-O. We're not distressed. That means completely out of it. Means to hem in closely, to anguish, to be in calamity. We're not completely distressed, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. Aporio. No answer. Have you ever been to a place where you didn't have any answer? Let me tell you, we'll give you more answers than anything else. Learn the Word of God. Learn these words and use them on people and they won't even know what you're talking about. Perplexed and not in despair. Despair is the word exaporeo. That means X-A-P. Absolutely no way out. He says, but we're not there yet. X A P O R E O. X Aporio. I spelled that wrong. It means no out, absolutely. But he says, we're not in despair with no way out, completely persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, cast down, Contra Ballo. Not completely thrown down. We're com thrown down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Taking our cross and dying daily. 
by telling people truth and standing for it. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in these mortal bodies that we're in. So people can see Christ in us. For we live, we which live are always delivered unto death, daily dying for Jesus' sake on a daily cross. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, not in our new bodies that we'll get when he comes, in our T-H-N-E-T-O-S, T-H-N-E-T-O-S. That's the word mortal. It's a form of the word T-H-A-N-O-S, which is the word death. This word mortal means liable to die. And it will die. So then, death works in us every day, but life in you, Corinthians. We die so you can live. We die daily. We take our cross and die daily in order to bring the elect to Christ and strengthen them. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore have, spo have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus. We've got something to look forward to and shall represent us with you for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, that's the outer man that can do nothing but serve the law of the flesh, yet the inward man is renewed every day for our light affliction. That word affliction is calypsis. Our light suffering, it's a light suffering compared to what we have hereafter. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look at the things which are seen, temporal, temporary, but at the things which are not seen. We look not at the things which are seen, cars, th houses, things, stuff. For the things which are seen are temporary, temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal things. I'm just, I'm overwhelmed at this message on Thalibo. I haven't gotten through it yet. I can't get through all the Thalibo words. They're not always the word. It's usually more than any other word. It's the word troubled. We are troubled. And welcome to the world of the believer. You're supposed to be troubled. You're not supposed to get out of trouble and feel comfortable. The only comfort you're going to get is in the Word of God and being with other believers. That's the only comfort we get. I'm not comforted in the world. Let me put it this way. I have put, I don't know how many, thousand 2,000 Greek words in my head. I'm ready like like Billy the Kid when I go out in public. I'm ready for anybody, any preacher, any doctor of theology because I know the doctors of theology don't know all these words, do not know all this culture and custom. I'm not impressed with PhDs on the Bible, not at all. Maybe you are, but I'm not. I've known some of them. Some of them are knuckleheads. And all I want to do is tell people the truth. That's all. I don't necessarily agree with the guy because he's written a book. Or he's a professor that's written a book. Or he's got an LLD and he's written a book. That's all I've got to say. I've got more to say. I've got so much more. I've got to get to 2 Corinthians 7 and 5 next time. I'm going to stay on this subject. I believe the blood baptism and the narrow way 
and the gospel are all exactly locked together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, sometimes I just feel so inadequate when it comes to teaching. I feel like you need to send an angel down here to teach. I'm so completely overwhelmed with everything. Give me strength. Give me physical strength to keep teaching. God, I'll praise you for everything and glorify you for everything. Fight our battles. I've got many people that want to stop me from teaching. Lord, stop them. And I'll give you praise for everything. In Christ's name, amen. Well, maybe we'll get a... You can't teach the gospel in one message. You just can't do it. You got to teach all the places where Thelebo is and Thelipsis is. I'm hanging on. Thank you, brother. Really enjoyed it today. I appreciate it. I love you, I love you too, man. Take care. I will. Well, what are you doing, Susan? What are you doing? Standing. <laughs> are you? I'm trying to stand, and I'm having a hard time doing it. I hope y'all don't think I'm John saying I, the same thing over and over because I'm trying to. I, I can't get, catch up with you when you're in So I just, I like to hear it. I just, I mean, there is so much to this narrow way. That's the gospel. That's the baptism. Yeah. And without people understanding that and wanting to dip in water, they'll never see it. Huh? I didn't answer that very well. I was thinking resurrection and. and uh, death to self but I just didn't say much but it's the <laughs> resurrection right. of Christ in us which it's is in us but that that's a long trip right like that's the gospel one, that's the, the beginning of the gospel that he's going to take vengeance on all those that are not obeying mm -hmm. they're not obeying the narrow way you know I found a set of McClintock and Strong and I bought them we bought them and when they when we got them they were. They didn't send us volumes eleven and twelve. Oh man! Now they claim they can't find them. 
So, uh, but those are supplemental volumes. Is there a lot of yeah. stuff in there too? Well, there's some, but not. But the eight, eight I, you can use them without that. Yeah, well, I am. But you can go online if you need the rest. Yeah, but I wanted to get my own physical set so bad. So, so I gotta go back here and get these ladies. Oh my 